Hello everyone and welcome from the College of Arts and Sciences. Thank you so much for joining us for Pandemics, Past, Present, Future. Now I'll turn it over to our moderator today, Thomas McDowell. Welcome to Pandemics, Past, Present, and Future. Coming to you from the History Department at The Ohio State University. My name is Thomas McDowell. I'm an associate professor in the department and speci I specialize in African and Indian Ocean history and the history of HIV AIDS. I will be your moderator. Today, we are living through a pandemic that is unprecedented in the lifetimes of nearly everyone alive. We have faced and will continue to face a great deal of uncertainty as the COVID-19 pandemic plays out. We are all figuring things out and trying to make meaning from this novel time. Yet, this is not the first time our species has confronted a pandemic threat for which we have no immunities. History can give us insights about how to live through and rebuild from a pandemic. And at Ohio State, we are lucky to have a leading national program in the history of health, environment, technology, and science. Historians at OSU and elsewhere have long studied pandemics, taught their lessons, and preached preparation. We believe that now, more than ever, insight about past pandemics and how they affect societies is essential for everyone. We are so happy that you've joined us today. And we're delighted to welcome four experts on the history of pandemics from Ohio State University. Christina Sessa will speak about the Justinianic plague. John Brooke will cover the Black Death. Jim Harris will address the 1918 influenza pandemic. And Aaron Moore will discuss HIV AIDS. Thus, we'll be hearing about three diseases over four time periods. And for those keeping score at home, the plagues, the plagues are both bacterial, while influenza and HIV are, like COVID-19, viruses. That will proceed. Each speaker will give us a brief overview of a historical pandemic with slides to augment their talk. After all four presenters have spoken, we'll open a discussion to ask the panel to respond to your questions. Many of you submitted questions when you registered, and we also will be collecting questions through the Q&A feature during the event. We've received hundreds of questions and we'll do our best to answer as many as we can. Okay, let's go ahead and get started with Christina Sessa on the Justinianic Plague. Tina Sessa is a historian of late antiquity. That is the period between the end of the Roman Empire and the start of the Middle Ages. Her most recent book examines daily life in this period, and she's currently working on a project that explores perceptions and responses to disasters, including the Justinianic Plague. Thank you and good afternoon, everybody. So the Justinianic Plague is the name we give to the first recorded outbreak or pandemic of bubonic plague in the late Roman or Byzantine Empire. And we first hear about it in our sources starting in 541 AD. And the plague recurred intermittently through the middle of the eighth century. So we call the Justinianic Plague the Justinianic Plague because the initial outbreak corresponds with the reign of the Emperor Justinian, and he's the dude in the middle there. Interestingly, Justinian was himself a casualty of the plague. He contracted the disease, although he didn't die from it. And there are two interesting kind of points we can take from that. First, it tells us a little bit about risk factors, and it tells us that age, social status, wealth, access to power, or you know, excellent medical care were really not the big risk factors. The biggest risk factor in terms of getting bubonic plague was where you lived. And for those people who lived in dense urban environments like the imperial capital of Constantinople where Justinian lived, you were much more likely to contract and die of bubonic plague than if you lived in a less densely populated rural community. Also, um, as Dodi mentioned, bubonic plague is a bacterial infection, which today we can treat very easily with antibiotics. How obvious, however, obviously in the sixth century, they didn't have antibiotics. And so the mortality rate for bubonic plague was extremely high. People, um, sorry, I don't know why I did that. Um, 
people who were uh, between uh, 60 and 80 percent of the population of people infected with the disease would have died from it. So it's pretty interesting that Justinian didn't, was one of the lucky ones who didn't manage to die. Um, we're going to hear in a few minutes about uh, the transmission of bubonic plague through fleas. So I'm going to talk instead a little bit about sources and what they tell us about living through plague, as well as a little bit of interesting facts about DNA. So all of those um, round circle, well, circles around, all of these black circles on your screen, these all are uh, cities where we have good literary evidence. We have texts that either refer to the pandemic briefly or in a very few number of cases, we have very detailed descriptions of the disease itself and more interestingly, of its impact on the community. And we we're especially well informed about the city of Constantinople, which is indicated by the arrow on the screen. Um, and we hear, for example, about the trauma the, of experiencing this. We hear about its impact on the community, the interruption of daily life, um, and the difficulty that people had carrying out routine tasks like burying the dead. Um, and like today, where we're kind of overwhelmed with the number of bodies and we can't perform normal our normal funeral rites, same thing happened during the Justinianic plague. So for a long time, all historians had to go on in terms of determining what exactly this disease was that people were dying from in the sixth century were literary sources. That was until about 20 years ago when scientists got involved and figured out a way to extract genetic material from the teeth of skeletons of people who died in this period. And what they found in that genetic material um, was the DNA of the pathogen that causes bubonic plague. And this is how we know for certain that this was the disease that, is the, that we call the Justinianic plague. And all of those squares, those are all set cemeteries where we found that DNA evidence. So did the plague end the Roman Empire? So this is the question. And for a long time, up until really recently, historians thought, yeah, it kind of did. It was, it was this catastrophic rupturing event that brought about the end of antiquity and the start of the Dark Ages. We, we thought it, it wiped out anywhere between 30 to 60 percent of the population. We thought it absolutely collapsed the economy, decimated the army, was really a factor in the end of a civilization. However, we've come very recently to rethink this. And we've, we've, re we've, we've basically started looking at different types of indicators, long-term indicators, that have given us a very different story. And so, for example, on your screen, you are looking at a graph uh, that shows us agricultural production. Um, and as you can see, agric ag agricultural production did not fall off during the Justinianic plague, it more or less continued apace. And so what does this tell us? Well, one of the things it tells us is that even if our witnesses, even if the people living through the plague felt like this was the end of the world, it actually wasn't. And that pandemics very often only have localized short-term impacts. Not always, but very often. So that's maybe good news for us. The other takeaway is that stories matter. How, how people in the past talked about plague really impacted how historians for a long time understood it. So as we move through our plague, I think we should think about how we're gonna talk about our own experiences and, uh, and, and, that's, and, and move forward like that. So in any event, thank you. Okay, thank you, Tina. We'll now turn to John Brooke to hear about the Black Death. John Brooke is an arts and scientists, sciences distinguished professor of history and the author of five books. One of them, Climate Change and the Course of Global History, A Rough Journey, demonstrates his mastery of global environmental history and situates Black Death, his topic today, as a gateway to modernity. 
Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, I'm going to turn our attention to the Black Death, the second, second pandemic of the same bubonic plague that had struck in the time of Justinian, but which had mutated into a distinctly more virulent disease um, in, the, in Central Asia early in the 1300s. The Black Death hit Europe between uh, for 13, 1347 and 1351, but had aftershocks that ran all the way to the, to the early 1700s. The plague may have spread from Central Asia to, to uh, China in the early 1200s, but it clearly spread from Central Asia to the Black Sea in the late 1340s, from where it spread as far as Southern England in one year. Traditionally, it's been assumed that the transmission of the plague involved the movement of the plague of plague infested fleas from wild rodents to the household black rat. Uh, increasingly, historians are arguing that it must have been transmitted via human fleas and human body lice. Uh, such would explain, explain its very rapid movement, uh, particularly through Europe. Uh, we know a lot about the impact of the Black Death from documentary record uh, and from archaeological excavations. Within the last few decades, the genetic signature of the plague has been positively identified in burials from across Europe. In the late 1340s, news of the plague spread and people knew it was coming. Plague pits such as you see here in the East Smithfield, London, uh, were dug before the arrival of the epidemic. The bacillus was deadly and took both rich and poor, rural and urban. The daughter of Edward III of England died of the plague in the summer of 1348. But quickly, at least in Europe, the rich learned to barricade their households against its reach and the poor suffered disproportionately. Strikingly, if a mother survived the plague, her children tended to survive. If she died, they died with her. In sum, after centuries of population growth, a conservative guess is that Europe's population was cut from 85 million to about 60 million, possibly more, and India may have dropped from uh, 105 to 75 million. China had suffered massively from the Mongol invasions and probably the plague in the previous century. What was the societal impact of the Black Death? Scholarship on, on Europe in the past 30 years has come to understand it as a critical inflection point, a profound rupture that reshaped the economy, society, and culture. We might want to think of this impact in ways broadly similar to those proposed in Naomi Klein's shock doctrine. Most immediately, the Black Death drove an intensification of religious belief and practice, manifested in portents of the millennium, in flagellant cults that undermined the authority of the clergy, and in Christian pogroms against Europe's Jews. That in same intensified religiosity, combined with the deaths of many uh, ministering clergy, fears of sending students on long, dangerous journeys, and the fortuitous appearance, where did they come from? Uh, large donations uh, coming from people who had just recently died, uh, led to enduring institution building. New universities, and colleges and older ones were suddenly founded in considerable numbers. The proliferation of new centers of learning and debate is seen as subtly undermining the unity of, the, of medieval Christianity and setting the stage for stronger national identities and the precursors of the Reformation. The plague's disruptive uh, experience also shaped new directions in medical knowledge. Historian Samuel Cohn has argued that the doctors tended uh, tending the sick during the plagues, began to rebel against the ancients. They had learned from their experience that disease was not caused by the alignment of the stars, but from a contagion, and they were committed to a new empiricism. Cohn argues that here lay the distant roots of the scientific revolution. Quarantines were directly connected to this new empiricism and the almost instinctive social distancing of Europe's middling and elite households. It has become clear that small pools of plague did get established in Europe for centuries, apparently in wild rodent communities in the high pass of the Alps. But it was also clear that at the, uh, at the time that the, the plague came from into the Mediterranean ports by ship. The first quarantine was established in 1377 in the Adriatic port of Ragusa. And by the 1460s, quarantines were routine uh, in the European Mediterranean. Major outbreaks of the plague in in, the, in 1665 and 1621 in Mar uh, London and Marseille were the result of the breakdown of these quarantine barriers. 
from the late 17th century to all the way to 1871, the Habsburg Empire maintained a, um, uh, an armed cordon sanitaire against the plague eruptions coming from the Ottoman Empire. As, uh, as it was with the rise of the National University, the building of quarantine structures against the plague was a dimension of the emergence of state power in Europe. Now, through all of this, the common people who survived the Black Death emerged uh, to new opportunities in empty lands. We have fairly good wage data for England, and wage rates rose dramatically um, and rapidly as, as masters looked for increasingly scarce labor. The famous French historian Marc Bloch argued that the Black Death brought an end to the Middle Ages in a crisis of the revenues flowing from the rich to the poor. And I'm going to stop there. Thank you, thank you, John. We'll, we'll now turn, we'll now turn to Jim Harris, who will talk to us about the 19th pandemic. Jim Harris received his PhD and has become one of the most popular lecturers in the department, teaching more than a thousand students in the last three years. They're drawn to his course and his global history of vaccines. He writes on influenza and the history of public health in Britain. Hello everyone and thanks Dodi for that introduction. Uh, I'm going to talk briefly in the next five minutes about the history of the 1918 influenza epidemic for you. <clears throat> the 1918 influenza epidemic caused far more cases than the past pandemics you've heard about in this webinar by, by orders of magnitude, though the Black Death may have uh, afflicted a percentage of the world greater than the uh, 1918 influenza. In 1918, this afflicted 500 million cases, and conservative estimates say there were at least 50 million deaths from the pandemic. This was 25 times larger than the average flu pandemic. And this flu pandemic had several important, um, unique characteristics to it, one of which was the nature of the deaths. In a typical flu pandemic, and there have been many from the at least uh, five in the last 150 years, uh, typically the very young and the very old are subject, are the ones who die most frequently. But in 1918, amid the ongoing First World War, those in the prime of life were also particularly, uh, 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 particularly died in this pandemic. And that wartime context is really important. And we're hearing a lot about the three waves of the 1918 influenza pandemic uh, today. And this graph shows those three waves and when they occurred in turn. And what we see here is that the second wave was by far the most uh, deadly phase of this pandemic. And I'm going to spend the next few minutes trying to walk us through these three waves very briefly. The 1918 flu pandemic likely first broke out in uh, Kansas in a military, a military uh, base in Kansas, Fort Riley, uh, where a Camp Cook reported sick in March of 1918. From there, the pandemic would follow uh, troop movements around the globe, uh, starting in the United States and moving outward from there. Uh, this map shows you the rate, uh, the spread of the pandemic over time, beginning in March and then over the summer months as it moved following U.S. troops to Europe. Then in August of 1918, the pandemic, the virus mutated, causing that second wave of the pandemic you saw in the previous graph. It struck almost simultaneously in late August of 1918 in three port cities. Boston, Massachusetts, Brest in France, and Freetown in Sierra Leone. These were all important military ports, Boston being a site where troops uh, were deployed from the American Expeditionary Force to Europe, Brest in France where American troops often landed, and Freetown was an important coaling station serving transatlantic troop movements. And this wartime context is really important for understanding the 1918 flu, because during a war, when you need to keep the war economy moving, 
uh, you can't enact quarantines and social distancing like we're employing in COVID-19 today. In the UK, where my research is primarily focused, uh, the head of public health, Sir Arthur Newsom, told Britons to simply keep calm and carry on. In the United States, they were more proactive, however, in enacting uh, uh, some, some, some public health measures. Uh, the United States public health responses, of course, varied from locality to locality and uh, <clears throat> afflicted people with very, in various uh, uh, disparate, uh, uh, populations were afflicted differently. Uh, in San Francisco, for example, mask wearing was, may, was compulsory under the law. And the results of that we can, and social distancing was, was enacted uh, uh, in, in various lengths and in very dura various durations in various cities. And we see from the 1918 flu pandemic the consequences that had in terms of mortality. And in places like our own Columbus, Ohio, uh, mortality rates were kept very low uh, because quarantine measures and, and uh, uh, limiting gatherings uh, were kept contained. Whereas in places like Philadelphia, where you see one of the worst cases of the pandemic here, uh, large parades to celebrate the war and to raise morale for the wartime uh, 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 experience uh, resulted in failures of the only effective public health measures you had when you couldn't see viruses at the time, such as was the case in 1918. And we'll talk, I know, more about the legacies of this in the Q&A, so I will stop there. Okay, thank you, Jim. Now, HIV AIDS. Just an historian of global health who has been conducting research in Uganda since 2009. She is currently based at Columbia's Mailman School of Public Health in New York and will be joining the faculty at Ohio State in the fall. In Columbus, she'll teach courses in human history and anthropology, public health, and human rights. Thank you. So the global HIV pandemic flared from 1981 to 2005 as a pandemic. And of course, it's still affecting people all over the world today. The HIV pandemic shares both similarities and differences with COVID-19, and today I'm going to talk about the emergence of HIV in different global populations, the development of antiretroviral therapy, or ART, which is now used to treat and prevent the virus, and how access to treatment was a matter of global economic justice. HIV, or the human immunodeficiency virus, is spread primarily by unprotected sex. The virus was first detected in 1980 in California among a group of otherwise healthy young men who developed immune diseases like pneumonia. By June of 1981, the U.S. Centers for Disease Control had reported on the virus in five young men at three different Los Angeles hospitals. And by the end of that summer, they had 108 cases, the majority of which were reported from California and New York. All but one of those cases were men, and over 90% of those infected stated that they were gay and sexually active. In the United States, HIV quickly became understood as a, quote, lifestyle disease associated primarily with men who have sex with men, an association drawn by national statistics, by activists from the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power, or ACT UP, a long-running LGBTQ organization that advocates for the rights of those with HIV, and by cultural production, such as Tony Kushner's Angels in America, which won the Pulitzer Prize for drama. By 1992, HIV AIDS became the leading cause of death for men in the United States. Since the beginning of the epidemic, more than 700,000 Americans have died. Sadly, HIV AIDS has had even more devastating and longer reaching impacts in Sub-Saharan Africa. So much so that the association between AIDS and the African continent is indelible in the public imagination. Africa's first case of HIV was documented in southwestern Uganda in 1982, where it was known locally as slim disease because it causes extreme weight loss. Uganda, a landlocked country in East Africa the size of Oregon, had one of the world's worst outbreaks. By the early 1990s, HIV was killing one adult for every three households in its state regions. 
A decade later, most people living with HIV and more than 75% of deaths from AIDS were in Sub-Saharan Africa. The vast majority of those infections were among young women, ages 15 to 24, and may remain so today. According to UNAIDS in Sub-Saharan Africa, three in five new infections among young people are in girls, whose gendered social and economic vulnerability puts their health at risk. Even with new infections every year, deaths from HIV have greatly rescinded. Fewer than half as many people are dying globally now than they were 15 years ago. The availability of antiretroviral therapy, or ART, has led to a steep decline in the number of adults and children dying from the virus, yet access to ART was and is unequally distributed, both within the United States and globally. In the U.S., researchers had developed effective ART by the late 1980s. However, the high cost of medication, originally as much as $15,000 a year, prevented many who needed it from accessing it. To demand affordable treatment, ACT UP organizers targeted Wall Street and the government, which eventually established a federal funding mechanism called the AIDS Drug Assistance Program to make ART affordable and widely available. As a result, by 1996, the death rate from HIV AIDS in the U.S. began to decline. Researchers have estimated that ART saved over 3 million years of human life in the U.S. between 1989 and 2003. In Sub-Saharan Africa, however, the high cost of ART prevented access to treatment for more than a decade. ART only became widely available on the continent in 2005, and only after activists pressured first the South African government, and then the World Trade Organization to block pharmaceutical companies' patents on the medication. In other words, Africans had access to life-saving HIV treatment only 10 years after Americans did, with life and death consequences, as this graph shows. And while more and more people are managing HIV with treatment, making it more like a chronic illness, UNAIDS estimates that 38% of people who need treatment cannot access it. So by way of conclusion, I just quickly say that while it's still too early to tell how COVID is going to play out on a global scale, I think thinking about HIV and comparing COVID to the HIV pandemic should attune us to the importance of equitable access to life-saving testing and treatment at the very least, and uh, even better to the importance of universal health care for all. Thank you. And, and thank you all for these informative overviews. Our, our audience has many questions, and we'd like to pose those to you now. Um, many of our viewers submitted questions when they registered. Thank you for that. Those for our first questions. You can also ask questions through the Q&A function of the webinar software, and I will be able to pose them. So I guess I'd first like to ask everyone to think, ask everyone to think a bit about the pandemic you study. Um, both Tina and John talked some degree about a, a paradigm shift that might be associated with their pandemic, um, but I was wondering if you might say something about the, the legacy of influenza or of HIV AIDS. Sure, happy, happy to talk about the, the legacy of <clears throat> influenza. So influenza, we like I said in my presentation very briefly, we've had numerous pandemics of influenza. We've had several uh, big ones in the course of the 20th century uh, in 1918, in 1957, in 1968, and in 2009. And <clears throat> these have each inspired uh, further advances in, in medical research. We couldn't see viruses in, in 1918, and we didn't have an understanding of the particular etiology of the disease. That research began in earnest because of wartime contexts, especially during World War II. And the legacy of the 1918 flu then was the beginning, though it was slow. We didn't see viruses till the 30s. Um, we didn't see viruses till the 30s um, in, in terms of new medic advances in medical research and trying to understand the nature of viruses. And Aaron, did you want to say something about your legacies? I've turned my video on to help the sound quality. Um, sure. Uh, when I think about the, the legacy of HIV, which of the HIV pandemic, which of course is still ongoing in some ways, I really think about, I think the legacy of loss um, suffered both in the United States and um, 
in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, Christina mentioned um, during the Justiana plague, um, the, the overwhelming amount of bodies that were there to be dealt with and the burial of these bodies. And I think, um, you know, I think HIV is still very much present in the minds of many people who, of the generation of gay men in the United States who lost, um, who lost partners and friends. And um, it's very much in the minds of the um, young people that I work with in, South, in Sub-Saharan Africa, in, in Uganda, who have lost parents, um, friends, and family members. They, um, in Uganda, they refer to um, HIV as a household disease because at least one person per household um, has died or knows someone who dies. And I think that those legacies of loss that surrounded the HIV pandemic are um, extremely important to think about with the collective mourning that we've only just begun here in the United States um, and will continue to grapple with as, um, as COVID continues to take people from us. So. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to turn, ask you all to think a little bit about someone who personifies the epidemic that you've talked about. What voices or points of view are most memorable, poignant, or important? What was it like for people to live through your pandemic? And I'll start with, I'd like to start with Tina and also ask her to address a question that just came through from the audience about the, you know, considering the frequency of domestic and international travel today, can the conclusion that the Justinian plague was only localized be applicable to today's situation? So um, I'll throw to Tina the question about lo the localized versus today's situation, but then also ask, then ask you all to come or personification of the epidemic that you've talked about. Sure. Um that's a great question. And I think, you know, one of the puzzling things about trying to put together the Justinianic plague is that we have these kind of isolated sources that's, that suggest that the plague did move. Um, we have literary sources that tell us it's in certain places. And then if you, I don't know if you can still see, I, I won't go back to the, 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 the map, but we, we have found plague all over the western part of the empire. I mean, as far away as Britain, which was barely part of the empire in the sixth century. Um, so I do think that we have to still think about it in a, in a similarity to today in that people did move around the Roman Empire. I mean, obviously they did it and they brought plague with them. However, obviously this is not on, on, you know, it's on a much, much, much smaller scale than what we're seeing today. And the movement of people today is just so much greater because of air, airplanes and other much quicker forms of travel. So I think there, it's, it's both similar. I mean, plague got around through people moving, through, through travel, through trade and whatnot, but not nearly to the extent that, that we've had problems today. Um, and in terms of memorable people, um, I would definitely have to go to a man named Procopius, who was a sixth century historian who himself lived through the plague. He was living in Constantinople right alongside Justinian. He did not get sick, but he wrote about it. Um, and I think one of the things that Procopius says that I always come back to is he talks about how after, during the plague, everybody sort of changed their behavior and, and became kind of better people. They became more moral, less greedy, all of those things. And within months of the plague subsiding from Constantinople, everybody went back to their old greedy ways. And I guess from what I take from what Procopius is saying is that what we learn from these kinds of disasters is that we don't learn. <laughs> and so I, if I can sort of put this forward to today, I hope we can learn something from what we're going through rather than just sort of have these kind of short-term fixes but not really make long-term changes. Other views on someone who personified the epidemic you're talking about? Well, I was gonna make a comment about the speed of, trans of, of movement. Um, there's really not much difference between the speed of movement between the age of the Justiniac plague and the Black Death. I mean, it's essentially, they're the same technology. It's nothing drastically different. Um, what probably was different was the virulence of the disease. Um, there had been genetic changes, and it probably was a somewhat different disease with a somewhat different kind of trajectory to it. Um, 
Well, but I'm, so, so, you know, really on a level playing field, but if we were if we look at a, a disease that we have skipped, which is cholera uh, in the 19th century, um, the uh, speed of movement is the speed of the steamship. And so when we talk about what's been happening to us right now and the movement of in the last 10 years, really, with the movement of uh, diseases by air travel, we can look at the 19th century and look at this, uh, look at the steamship context and the sudden impact of, of cholera in waves coming out of out of the Bay of Bengal and into the global system, having huge impacts um, that clearly, you know, the, the tr transportation and m movement does matter. And it's a combination of both the virulence of the disease and the vehicles that we put in place to have vehicles to put to put the disease in motion. Um, and I'll just, for, for, for personification, I'll just talk about an anonymous orphan uh, who, who, who survived the Black Death in great trauma um, and probably was you know, psychologically damaged, but inherited some property from you know, cousin so-and-so and ended up, you know, uh, in a, what happened in the wake of the Black Death was for about 150 years, People did okay. Um, they did better than they had in the past. They're, they were bigger people. The bioarchaeology shows they were larger and healthier. Um, so um, uh, I don't want to make an analogy to today, but in the in the in the in the Middle Ages, uh, the it's very clear that that generally a Malthusian pressure was released, and people were uh, people did a little better for for uh, for about two centuries. I like to constantly think about 1918 in, and as I tried to highlight in my presentation, the wartime connection. And when I was doing my research on these interconnections, I um, came across the memoir of an artillery officer in the British Army whose name was Richard Foote. And I think an anecdote that I um, reference in, in Richard Foote's memoir is particularly uh, 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 insightful in, t in thinking about how people of different social classes, in, in the case of this anecdote, an officer in the army versus an enlisted man experience this pandemic differently. And in his memoirs, he describes how he was uh, on the march in Germany in the, after the war ended, but in, in the occupation, and he was feeling awful as he experienced the symptoms of flu and had to stand in formation and so forth. But then uh, he says he was able to leave his unit after, after they performed the ceremonial introduction in the city. And he was able to rest in the second floor of a, of a I think it's a baker's shop and lied, lied in firm for a couple days. But he then goes on to describe how his friend, uh, an enlisted man, uh, Fitter Othen is the soldier's name, was forced to keep on the march because he was a lower rank and he ended up dying before he gets to field hospital as a result. And so different classes experience this in, in, and different social circumstances greatly impact how one experiences a plague. And I think that anecdote is a very vivid example of that. Um, in, the, um, in, the, in my case, for in the HIV case, there are a number of um, activists who I think have really um, embodied and, and um, taken on the the, um, the cause of, of AIDS activism. But I kind of wanted to think about the um, about personification in terms of um, high risk kind of categories for uh, for the medical um, for 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 medical interventions. And I think that there because I think that there's something um, uh, important like there's an important distinction here between HIV and the rest of the pandemics that have been described, which is that um, HIV is, of course, mostly transmitted through, by, through sex, um, otherwise intravenous drug use. So there is a way in which individuals' social behaviors could be um, altered or intervened upon, which has, led to, um, which has led to a number of interventions that try to intervene in the behaviors of, for example, sex workers, um, men who have sex with men more generally. Um, and so I think that I'm kind of trying to highlight the, the way that these kinds of character types have emerged in terms of medical intervention um, in order to suggest that, um, uh, that these behavioral interventions um, often 
attach uh, certain, often attach behaviors to certain kinds of people as opposed to looking at their, the broader economic context that are kind of uh, creating the conditions in which people are, for example, having sex for money. Um, so yeah, that's my answer to the personification question. Okay, fantastic. We're getting a lot of questions from the audience about ended the pandemic that you're talking about. And Aaron's already said that, of course, the HIV AIDS pandemic is, or epidemic is continuing in some ways, um, but for the, especially for those we didn't have, that didn't have medicines to do so. And I'd like to ask you to, to think about that and also to say the end of your, the pandemic that you've talked about and also to what life looked immediately after your pandemic and how we might think about our own process of emerging from the crisis. Um, so, um, Start to think about what what stopped or ended the the influenza um, epidemic, and what did life look immediately after? What did life look like immediately afterwards? In the case of 1918, it, it actually continues on until this winter of 1919. The pandemic petered out naturally, by and large. It 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 infect it came it infected it devastated and then it went away. That's what happens with flu. It's, it's the typical flu cycle on a, on a, on a much, much bigger scale. Um, in terms of what life looked like afterwards, the pandemic, as one historian, Alfred Crosby, in a, in a, in a bit dated book, but still important book, uh, he calls it America's forgotten pandemic. Until relatively recently, uh, uh, we kind of ignored it in, 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 in sort of broad uh, historical context. Historians, specialists have, have continued to think about it, but, but it was kind of neglected. And now the impact is the last huge, huge mortality scale has made it have its comeback, as it were, in terms of the popular uh, uh, imagination. Uh, in, it's really hard to disaggregate, disaggregate the legacy of the immediate legacy of the flu from from the war uh the rebuilding in the early 1920s economic uh down the economic recovery and whatnot just were a um uh, they exacerbated one another someone else want to jump in there to think about the, in, in how your plague or how your uh, epidemic ended and um, how we might think about the process of emerging from crisis? I'll start and then John can go. Um, so we don't really know how the Justinianic plague ended. We, our sources like Procopius talk about a, a cycle of a three or four month period where it was really bad. And then it just kind of mysteriously leaving. Um, I should say it, it probably never went away entirely because as I mentioned, the plague came back uh, over, you know, in waves for the next 200 years. Um, in terms of what life looked like right afterwards, well, I, I think it was probably pretty awful. Um, we have lots of descriptions of um, people, people dying, people abandoning where they're living to leave, to try to go leave the city, get someplace where you might be away from um, all the dying. Um, there was a vague understanding of contagion in, in the ancient world, and so people kind of got that. Um, people leaving behind all of their all of their wealth, and in fact, one of the things that our sources talk about are people taking advantage of this, people stealing the 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 money or goods or animals from people who had died or had to run away during the plague. So it seems like it was extremely chaotic um, and a lot of opportunistic behaviors, um, people trying to sort of get a win out of somebody else's loss. And you know, I you know, to, to what extent we see that right now with price gouging, hoarding, things like that. I think we definitely saw those kinds of behaviors in during the Justinianic plague. Um, but John, do you want to pick up and talk about the uh, Black Death? Okay. Um, yeah, a couple of things. I want to I want to talk about the Black Death. I also want to talk about a question that came from the floor, which relates to all of this in a big picture. Um, 
what is striking about the Black Death is that I would argue the long term, there are these huge echo effects, which I haven't even talked about, um, that reach us all the way to, you know, huge epidemics in North America and the Americas, you know, as a distant aftershocks. But immediately, I think it's what's interesting, listening to um, Tina's description of what happened in the, in the ancient world, it's actually the state worked better. And what is striking, I mean, I was just reading about, about the aftermath of yeah, the, the Black Death once again. And, you know, the things were kept under control. Uh, the, the state worked. Uh, they actually dug their trenches before the plague got there. Uh, this, you know, and, um, and I think this is where, where I want to segue to a, a bigger topic, which is the question of governance, the question of the effectiveness of governance. Um, and uh, what is striking is, in fact, how marginally effective it really was during the Middle Ages and uh, in the in the year in the decades years following, uh, among other things, um, of you know the foundation of of the of the quarantines as you know the mention of state power and the enforcement of the quarantines. Um, so um, uh, we have a question. One of my students, uh, Dave Bergenzi, who asked a question about about poverty. Uh, what have why why are we still um, the, uh, why does the, the COVID-19 uh, epidemic striking the poor so hard now? Um, and, you know, this does have to do with the central legacy of all of these epidemics, which is that um, we, over the course of the 19th and 20th centuries, we developed an infrastructure called public health, a, a branch of government to deal with um, the great epidemics of the past, and they kept things more or less under control. And um, what we've done is let that fray, and we've also allowed into public office people who do not think government should exist. And I would point out that that is the way to death. It will destroy us if, we, if we've let down our guard. And I'm going to say one more thing. I, many, many years ago, I spent, I spent about just eight months out of the country, including spending time in India and Afghanistan. Um, and I came back to this country and said, oh, we live in a bubble. We live in a world protected by the great legislation and the great efforts of the progressive period. And we are letting it go. We are piercing our own bubble. We have pierced the bubble uh, and we are now part of the world. Uh, nobody likes that. Well, one of the reasons that happened was that we let down our guard and we government has failed us, the national government has failed us in an enormous way. Um, and so I will let you all draw what lessons you will. So actually, Aaron, can I, re can I direct that to you? Because one of the echoes we see here is of people being feeling let down by government. The HIV AIDS in the early 1980s disaffected in the US government response. How might you put that in contrast to what John just said? Um, we, so, I mean, I, I totally agree that we, that HIV, well, so, and to the question also of the kind of end of the epidemic, of course, HIV isn't over. It's over for those who can afford treatment and who can access treatment. So it's still ongoing. And the numbers, both in the United States and globally, show that it is the most economically vulnerable who are still at risk of acquiring HIV and that who can't find treatment. Um, and this, I think, just as John was saying, is a failure of public health and of public health systems more generally. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, so in that way, I think that the HIV pandemic, um, I mean, it's, it's striking how, um, at least in the US context, how um, similar uh, kind of like their racial and economic categories are that overlap between COVID um, and, and the men who are at risk for HIV, mainly African American um, men are at higher risk for acquiring both of those uh, for, for, for acquiring both. Um, with COVID, of course, it's because of the existing conditions like hypertension and type 2 diabetes, but the fact that those conditions exist and can be and exist in, in higher rates among certain groups of people is itself a failure of unequal uh, public health access. Okay, just in terms of thinking about where we are now with COVID-19, um, to understand the present and to look towards the future. Like given what we, what we know um, about past pandemics, 
how would you teach the current one? You, you are all very skilled teachers. Um, what are the stories to tell, the takeaways for students, the, thing, the important things to focus on? How would you, how would you conceptualize a, a course on COVID-19 that would also pull out themes that you've talked about in other pandemics? I teach a whole course on the history of disease. I believe our new colleague, Aaron, is gonna actually teach this course in the fall. So can, I'm very excited to collaborate with her. Um, but I teach a course on the history of, of disease. And I ask the students pretty much every lecture and to frame the whole course around the question of how has disease had a social impact? So not just thinking about raw, um, raw numbers, raw, you know, graphing uh, cases, infections, deaths, etc. But thinking about these actual human impacts, how have they changed uh, social structures, how have they changed class uh, organization, how have they thought, influenced how humans treat each other. There, in, in, in that course, I talk about the, the diseases my colleagues have talked about as well, and, and in both the case of the Black Death in particular and in HIV, there was a great deal of stigma in the immediate aftermath of, 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 those, of those diseases uh, as, as various populations were victimized and demonized by the masses in the initial wave of these pandemics. And I think we need to be careful about being empathic and using history to teach empathy and to not stigmatize uh, 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 carriers or patients of, of this disease. And so I would ask students to continue to think about how is this affecting daily life in an ongoing way. Other thoughts on teaching this current pandemic? Um, um, yeah, I would sort of go back to something I said earlier about stories and about how we narrate a pandemic when we're in it um, and one of you know some of the sources from the Justiniana plague they just they describe the the plague in terms of divine judgment that the plague is basically God's judgment of man and and his punishment for for sinful behavior and this was a very dominant narrative um, that makes a lot of sense for the time and I guess I'm a little bit disturbed by some of the narratives that, that we're throwing around, narratives about Chinese uh, secret labs manufacturing viruses to, you know, take over the world, these kinds of narratives that are so, you know, patently false, but yet are being perpetuated, um, but, are, but have a lot of power. And, and I think we need to think about, again, how are we gonna tell this story of, of COVID. Um, and so that would be the way I would try to teach it, looking at the stories and how we, how people are, are narrating it as we're in it. Um, so that would be my two cents as a, like, as an ancient historian. Um, really quickly, I, I would just repeat a point that I made before. The sto those stories will be political. Um, we, we could, I'm, and I, I'm ready to bet that people are putting the other courses uh, maybe not in history departments, but in other departments on the politics of COVID. Um, that this has a political dimension, this has a governance dimension. Um, all these epidemics do. We manage nature as it comes at us. And um, um, the question is, uh, I, you know, not just um, what's its, its social and cultural framing, but how do we, how do we re mobilize resources to, to handle the challenge? Um, and my, so I would teach, um, in addition to whatever, what my colleagues have all said, which are, which are great approaches, I'd also want to be sure to focus on um, kind of the difference between epidemics or pandemics as events and then the longer structure of public health, right? So to, in order to understand like why certain people are getting sicker than other people um, and to understand that as, as a longer that has a much deeper history um, in, the United, in the context of the United States and globally. Okay, I we're, I with my eye on the clock, I realize we're getting close to the, the round.
you here we have four distinguished historians who think about pandemics and have thought about the past. I'd like to turn to you for some advice on how we prepare for the next pandemic. Um, in the time. Um, so given what we what lessons we should take, how how do we prepare for the next pandemic? Who would like to start? All right, why not? Um, so in ancient Rome, there was no such thing as public health. There was no such thing as the CDC. And that tells us a lot about the problems that they had. So my advice is we need to invest more in our institutions of public health, period. Other thoughts? Yeah, just simply, you know, global coordination really, really matters. Uh, again, diseases, nature does not respect political boundaries. And we operate, we think we're operating in some kind of world of chopped up boundaries and it doesn't, it, you know, we have to think globally. We have to act globally. I'm going to sound like a <clears throat> broken wheel here, or broken record, excuse me, mixing my metaphors, as I echo what Tina and John basically just said, which is, what we've learned through the, through the history of past pandemics is we've gotten faster at responding. We, we share information more. We're in a, we are in a global world. Uh, we live in a global world. Uh, labs can sequence uh, 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 diseases much faster than, well, they, we couldn't even see viruses 100 years ago, right? Now we can sequence viruses in, gene sequences in, in, in months. And so, but that takes coordination, that takes global cooperation, that takes tremendous uh, financial and human resources to do. And so uh, preparing requires continuing to invest and build up these, these global systems like the World Health Organization. Okay, I think we are about out of time. So Ben, and thank you all for joining us today. I'm Christina Sessa, John Harris, and Aaron Moore for sharing their expertise. Please join me in giving applause. We would also like to thank all the people in the College of Arts and Sciences who made this possible, especially Clara Davidson, the History Department, the Harvey Goldberg Center for Teaching Excellence, and the magazine Origins, current events and historical perspective for their sponsorship. And once again, thank you, our audience, for your excellent questions and for your ongoing connection to Ohio State. Stay safe and healthy, and when in doubt, of our health professionals. Thank you so much for joining us today. <laughs>